As the title of this part suggests, we'll be spending most of the program looking at the making of the Pet Sounds album and also at its reception when it was released. Glenn Campbell had joined the band briefly but had left to pursue his own career. Another old friend of the Beach Boys was Bruce Johnston. In 1963, I was working at Columbia Records across the street from where they were recording and also when Jan and Dean were having their kind of successful, similar Beach Boys sounds. It was all kind of a little triangle. There was Here was Columbia Records and then Western Recorders across the street and then next door to Western United. And uh, I kind of met them through just making similar records. Cause we're gonna shut you down That was a song called Trophy Machine, written by Bruce Johnston and Terry Melcher, and sung by the group they're involved in, the Rip Chords. They themselves had also recorded under the name of Bruce and Terry. Anyway, back to Bruce. A couple of years passed, and I was asked by Mike Love to find somebody to replace Brian, because Brian couldn't go on a tour. So I called a few people, and... Uh, you know, they, they wanted someone yesterday. It was a real rush thing. And I said, well, look, Mike, I can't find anybody. I'll come. I don't play bass. I play piano. But I suppose I could sing all the parts if you show me what you want me to do. So about an hour later, I was on my way down to the airport, and I flew to New Orleans. And that was uh, in April of 1965. And I performed with the group. And uh, I completed the tour came home and uh, they asked me to go on another tour so I said well all right I mean I was still working for Columbia Records as a record manager and I was kind of reluctant to leave because I felt that Brian would come back in the group but what happened was I came home I think from the second tour and they just said well, why don't you come down and sing on, on the next album I said well all right and it was called summer days and summer nights and the first song that I sang on was California girls Well, as Bruce Johnston said, California Girls was recorded for the Summer Days and Summer Nights album, which came out in June 1965, although it was also released as a single a month later. There are some other fine songs on that album too, including this short one sung a cappella. You're so Beach Boys and Your Dream Comes True. And it's interesting that on the back of the album cover, Brian comments that he's writing his sleeve notes at a coffee table, where Carl, Ron Swallow and Earl Leaf, two friends of theirs, and three girls, are all sitting around singing Beatles songs. But my mind's somewhere else right now, says Brian. I'm still working on ideas for this album. We had an unbelievable hassle trying to finish up the songs. Perhaps it was a combination of these factors that gave Brian the idea for their next album to be released in the November of that year. It was called simply Beach Boys Party and included their versions of three Beatles songs and various other tunes that they sometimes sang. Carl Wilson's quite honest about their reasons for recording it. That was really just to give us time. We just did that so we'd have time to do Pet Sounds. And so it only took a few days and that was it. And I thought it was a pretty odd record at the time. But then we were having the pressures from Capitol Records to give us another one of these, another give us another record, and, mm. you know, like that. So we got caught up into the, to the business part of it, definitely did. But once again, business for the Beach Boys was good, particularly for the song that was lifted from the album for their next single. Here's Dean Torrance of Jan and Dean. Now, Barbara Ant came off an album called the Beach Boy Party album. Now, the original concept for that was the Beach Boys were having a party, and of course, us being one of their closest friends musically and personally, um, we would be at the party too. And uh, it would be acknowledged that we were at the party and or other people, uh, whoever we could clear legally, would also be there. Maybe some of the Raiders or a couple of the Raiders or whoever. And also the pictures would be incorporated, traditional party pictures. 
Well, we went into our record company to get that all cleared legally. And they said, there's no way you're going to do that unless they agree to do the same. We said, well, we don't want to do a party album. We just don't want to do everything they do. When we come up with a concept where we can use them, we'll let you know. They said, well, we got to have it in writing. We said, now, wait a minute. We don't have them pinned down. They're not just not going to sign an open agreement that they're going to do whatever we ask them to do. We don't have a concept yet. Well, then make one up. We can't make one up yet. <laughs> just take our word for it. We're all ethical. We believe in them. They believe in us. And, and we work fine. And, and don't get in the middle of it. Just let us do it. No, you can't do it. Matter of fact, now that we know that you're going to do it, we're going to watch closely and see if you do do it. And if you do do it, we're going to hold up your royalties. So Jan said, oh, well, when it came to royalties, <laughs> that made all the difference in the world. Well, uh, in that case, uh, so Jan said, well, I'm not going to do it. You know, and well, I'll explain it to Brian why we can't do it. I said, well, if I feel like doing it, I'm going to do it. Jan said, you better not. I said, well, they won't hold up your royalties, so just hold up mine. I don't care. I'm living at home. <laughs> I have no overhead. So uh, I went to the party, part of the party, which was down at Mike Love's house. And I was in some of the pictures playing volleyball, and they cut me out except for my arm in one shot. And then when it came to recording, we were in the studio one night. We were, like, in Studio A, and they were always in Studio B, or vice versa. And um, Jan was trying to put on a lead to a song that he wrote that I thought was one of the all-time worst songs that I'd ever heard. So I said, well, you finish your lead, and I don't feel like listening to this song, so I'm going to go down and see what the Beach Boys are doing. He said, well, don't sing. And I said, oh, don't worry. <laughs> I won't sing. And I go down, and I open up the door and walk in, and within two minutes, we're doing Barbara Ann. But when I walked in, I, I, somebody asked me, I, th I think it was Mike, said, Hey, Dean, okay, let's, let's do a song. So I said, Well, what have you done so far? And he said, So and so and so and so and so and so. They said, What do you want to sing? I said, How about Barbara Ann? And we'd done it on an album about a year before, but never really did it as well as it could have been done. And I don't know why I said Barbara Ann. I have no idea. I just said, Let's do Barbara Ann. So I said, Okay. And on the album, we started out a couple of times and changed the key because it was either too high or too low, I don't remember. Then finally sang the song as best as we could all the way through, and it must have been one take, just that quick. And um, on the end, Carl said, thank you, Dean. I said, well, thank you, guys, goodbye. And I walked out, walked back and went to our session, where Jan was uh, still working on maybe the first three bars of the first verse. <laughs> And I'd gone down and cut a number one record, you know. I mean, a, a huge, huge, all-time selling number one record in about three minutes. He came back and he was still working on this thing, which n never even was released. Some sort of message there, and I have <laughs> still haven't found out what it is. The record that's so reminiscent of all mid-60s parties, and as Dean Torrent said, another worldwide hit for the Beach Boys. So, with the breathing space gained by the release of the Simply Produced Party album, Brian and the group were able to give time and concentration to a more complex form of production. The concentration was mostly Brian's as the group continued to tour. As for the time, while well, Carl isn't too sure how long the whole project took. It could have been close to a year. The thing is that it just sort of unfolded, you know. It wasn't a conscious thing until after Brian w really got into it. Then he got a hold of a direction, you know, he got a hold of, of a concept and he went with it, you know. I think Sloop John B was the first track. Alan had the idea to do that particular song. And just coincidentally, Brian was just really unfolding at that time and really evolving musically. So he did up a, a really, that's a pretty unique arrangement for that tune, you know, for a folk song, you know, to come across with the strength that it did. Come on, Sloop John B. Sloop John B was released as a single in March of 1966, a couple of months before the Pet Sounds album, and in many ways it forms a link between their last studio recorded albums, Summer Days and Summer Nights, and Pet Sounds itself. There's a similarity, for instance, to Phil Spector's song Then He Kiss Me, which is on Summer Days, but the overall sound of both voices and backing is somehow richer. 
When one talks of a concept album, the strength of the term ought really to be defined. It's possible to make out a case for some of the Beach Boys' earlier albums to be regarded as concepts if you consider that only implies similarity of subject matter in the songs. Thus, albums like Surfing USA and Surfer Girl were obviously mostly about surfing, while Shut Down Volume 2 and Little Deuce Coop were about hot rodding. But the point is that nobody actually sat down and worked out what the overall shape and feel of the albums would be before they were produced. They were just a collection of songs they recorded as they went along. As Carl suggested just now, once Brian had found the direction he wanted to take with Pet Sounds, he was very sure of what he wanted to do. His wife Marilyn remembers this well. Oh yeah, he, he said to me one night, he said, Mayor, I'm going to write and I'm going to make the greatest rock album. That's when, you know, things were starting to get a little bit heavier. And he, he just said, I'm going to do the greatest album. And he did it. I remember when the album was completely finished and he brought home the demo disc of the album. And we just, you know, laid down on the bed and just listened. It was like heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was so proud. It was really a beautiful experience because to hear everything that he had in his mind and believe me, what he has in his mind, nobody will ever know. But to hear it right there, you just, oh boy, he was so proud of it. I can so much in your well, as I said, the group had continued to tour, certainly during the embryonic stages of the album anyway. Dean Torrance. I thought they had one of the perfect setups I'd ever seen, and that they had the producer sitting at home, coming up with the great songs, writing the songs, uh, arranging, cutting the tracks, and sometimes waiting for them to get home, and sometimes not. So your music's being cut, and the group is out on the road promoting, so you're doing two things at once. And hopefully you do them both well, and at the time they were doing both very well. Al Jardine. When we were in Japan, he uh, put Pet Sounds together. And then we came back and did all the overdubs and all the, the vocalizing. He basically put the tracks together for that album. So had he been on tour with us, I don't know if it would have been uh, done at all. And Carl Wilson. Now that was the beginning of 66. When we were in Japan, I'd call up and Brian would do a track that he'd done to record it. And, you know, it's a funny, th Good Vibration should have been on that record. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know why it wasn't. I think that it could have been just trying to hold it for a, a single, you know, not put it on an album. It could have been something, some idea like that. The other thing that, that interests me, Carl, about the album, had you consciously tried things out on previous albums leading up to Pet Sounds? Well, well understand? Brian would just say, I want to try this or do, you know. He'd just get an idea, you know, and that, that would be it. Mm. As far as the songs, they came out very spontaneously. As far as writing melodies and making up tunes, it was like it was almost automatic, really. You know, he made up some really nice songs and just, God only knows, I think, came out in five minutes. You know, just came right through. And that was a special tune for us, too. That and You Still Believe in Me. You Still Believe in Me was really easy. That one just sang itself, you know, it was like really, it happened naturally. So Brian had set out to write and produce something really special. But did the rest of the group realize this when they were actually working on the album? Dennis Wilson. I knew it was. I'd never heard anything quite like that before. I mean, I've heard, you know, pieces that were involved and in, uh, pretty much intertwined melody-wise. A lot of the weaving of melodies, you know, but I never experienced uh, actually doing it, performing it, you know. So... I knew by doing it that it was special. Al Jardine. Well, really, I mean, it was a whole new horizon for us. And Brian just introduced a whole new concept in music. Well, pop music. He put pop music in a very special place. And uh, the group went through those changes. Because we were a surfing group when we left the country. You know, basically, and we came back to this new music. And uh, it took some getting used to. Mm. It was a, a different kind of singing. So a more subtle approach to, to, to pop music. 
it wasn't just bashing out one tune after another. It was it took a lot of skill, and uh, I learned a lot myself. So how much time did first Brian and then the group spend on that album? Brian knocked that out pretty quick. The tracks, but the vocals were another thing. Those were arduous, tedious, long, long hours. I think we spent about at that time. This is a lot of money, seventy thousand bucks, on Pet Sounds alone. And Mike Love certainly remembers working hard on that album. I don't know if we ever thought, well, this is really going to shake the world or anything, but we really worked our buns off on it, so to speak. And we knew the integrity of the music. We knew that we worked and worked on the harmonies, and if there was the slightest little hint of a sharp or flat, it wouldn't go on. We'd do it over again until it was right. So I think we worked more than I've ever known anybody else to work. You know, in terms of trying to perfect, not that I wanted to be that perfect. I always felt that, wow, I mean, you know, who's going to hear it but somebody with ears the the pitch of a dog? You know, they can hear high, you know, whistles that beyond the human ear. But Brian had those kind of ears, you know. So, okay, we'll do it another time, you know. And he was going for every subtle nuance that you could conceivably think of. Every voice had to be right. Every voice in its resonance and tonality had to be right. The timing had to be right. The timber of the voice it just had to be key wrecked according to that time how he felt and then he might the next day completely throw that out and we might have to do it over again and carl knew exactly what they were about we were really trying to make a good album we wanted to take a step you know and the group definitely stretched on that one you know the group was doing something yeah. wouldn't it be nice i think it's the tune that really brought that hope to all of us because we did about oh, at least 10 sessions on it and it just wasn't right I'd still think that we sang a little rushed and the background part wasn't really laying in to the rest of the track. With an album as fresh and as innovative as this one, it was obviously necessary to have the full backing of the record company. But did the Beach Boys get it? Carl Wilson. Capitol Records, I think it, they were a little bit afraid of it because they probably thought they'd lose a, a market or a segment of people, you know, I don't know. That's the way it was at the time. I think that they probably would think differently now. And Bruce Johnston. Maybe Capital didn't see the evolution of the whole Beach Boys 62 to 66 uh, panorama. But uh, this album was so radical compared to the really nice commercial Barbara Ann's that we'd been making that they'd been so successful in selling that they just wanted more so instead of promoting Pet Sounds here in America even though we had Wouldn't It Be Nice and God Only Knows and Sloop John B out of that album become successful singles uh, they turned around and put out the first best of the Beach Boys and promoted that and it went gold quickly and they didn't promote Pet Sounds because they said that uh, it wasn't commercial and that people wouldn't understand it and we were making our big gamble of kind of growing up in music and Capitol just... Uh, I mean, I don't dislike anybody at Capitol, but they just uh, didn't think that this was the direction we should take. So they didn't promote it. The Vice President of Promotion for Capitol Records, Al Corey. Well, I'll tell you something. I think that uh, Capitol as a record company, and, uh, which consisted of many people, you know, many uh, promotion people and sales people, which is a record company, uh, some of the people were very, you know, uh, carried away with the album and felt like it was an important album. Other people probably couldn't relate to it because I, I really think that the album was probably ahead of its time. I think that most people today realize that it was. I remember one thing. I remember that the album did receive good exposure at the time, but yet it didn't sell. The retail activity on on the LP was not as good as previously released Beach Boy albums. I know there's an answer. Well, being the shrewd person that he is, Bruce Johnston already decided that the record would need all the help it could get and that he could give it. I felt that I really should uh, go all out for the group because I knew the music was getting complicated and it was going to be a little harder to uh, have people digest it. I saw Brian progressing and I thought, uh-oh, well, we've got these commercial songs like Sloop John B and California Girls and Barbara Ann uh, that we've put out, but now he's getting in the pet sounds. 
Well, I can remember what happened to Phil Spector with that Ike and Tina, uh, River Deep Mountain High. It didn't go down here at all. But uh, I thought, well, if Brian's going to kind of get into things like that, I better get out there and make sure the Beach Boys have some kind of a, uh, a look about them, some kind of a public look. So what I did was after a tour in April of 1966, Barbara Ann had already been number one here in the States. We had just come back from Japan, then we made Pet Sounds in February and March, and uh, Capital had just put it out here in the States. And so I got on a plane, and I went to England in May, and I stayed at a hotel called the Waldorf. And uh, I got a, a suite so I could have a drawing room so I could see people, and I had a couple of English friends of mine set up interviews because I thought, well, I better start promoting now for when we come over in November. And I don't know if I did a good job or not, but I do know that I caused EMI to put Pet Sounds out three or four months earlier than they'd planned. And that was my first English trip. In fact, the last night I was in London, Lennon and McCartney came over with Keith Moon one night uh, to listen to the album, Pet Sounds album. I think they liked it. Another visitor to the hotel was Tony Rivers. Bruce makes his big entrance. He came in wearing a white suit and white shirt and white tie and white shoes. I, God, it's like the homo man coming in, you know. <laughs> and he was really made it, and he's all brown and handsome. And I thought, Jesus Christ, you know, this is really how the Beach Boys, I think everybody who knew the Beach Boys felt that way. That that's what they were, the all-American boys with the short hair and the good, clean image. And this was it, you know, Bruce is your actual all-American boy. But, you know, the appearance is a bit deceptive because he was quite earthy, really. Anyway, he had the, um, their new album, Pet Sounds, because I went green when I heard that he got it. And he said, how would you like me to play it for you? And he gave me a preview of it. And he suggested a number from it that I should record with the group. I thought, this is a good idea, maybe. Because we really weren't the Beach Boys. It, it seemed like a good idea at the time, which is a good title for an album. And so he suggested God Only Knows. And I, you know, played the track again. I thought, yeah, it's, it's a great song. There again, it's so different, and it's so well produced. Oh, the production slayed me. And he gave us an album, you know, and I took it away and played it to the rest of the boys, you know. And we all said, yeah, sure. So we went into his small studio and did a, a rough demo of it. See how it came out. And we were in there recording it, and by a complete surprise, Terry Melcher walked in. And we knew Terry Melcher from things like the Rip Chords. And he suddenly said, I was on that. What? He said, sure, I'm on one of those voices at the end. And because this was new to us as well. We just thought it was the Beach Boys, but apparently they used loads of different people at the end, coming in all, all the counterpoint harmonies at the end. Anyway, he liked the way we were doing it. So we recorded it properly. That was my first production, actually. And we made it more up-tempo than their way. <laughs> In the end, we should really never have done it because we were on EMI, the Beach Boys were on EMI. I mean, we'd been suggested this song by Bruce Johnson, so it, which seemed fair enough. If the boys themselves said, do it, then we were going to do it. Uh, anyway, we did it. EMI suddenly got a cable from the state saying, Capitol Records wish to release God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. Well, EMI told us, and we were a bit shattered, but we said, OK, well, don't release our one then. And they said, oh, no, we think we're going to release your one still. And we went, don't be silly, you know, how can you release our one with the Beach Boys bring it out themselves? And they said, no, we'll bring yours out a week earlier. And we thought, oh, great, that's great planning, you know, bring it out a week earlier, we'll scoop 100,000 before the Beach Boys, will we? Oh, silly company, you know. Anyway, in the end, the Beach Boys one was released on the same day as our one, and we actually made the top 50, which was, for us, was pretty good going, because we never knew what the top 50 was, really, and we got in about 48 for about 10 minutes, I think it was, you know, and it disappeared rapidly. We met Bruce Johnson a, a while after that, when they came over, and it was full of apologies, saying, you know, it really wasn't their fault, because he really realised that he'd suggested that we do it, and there we were, you know. <laughs> Right in the middle of a problem, with the Beach Boys sitting with a great record. The feel on theirs, I mean, was we didn't go for feel then. You weren't into that. You really, we were just trying to get a commercial record to get into the charts, you know. 
we did it in our own style, but unfortunately, we were slightly outweighed by the opposition, I feel. <laughs> Only slightly. As Tony Rivers said just now, they were with the same company as the Beach Boys in England, which was EMI. And so were the Rob Storm Group, who covered another number from Pet Sounds, here today, and made a pretty good job of it too. Not much problem for the Beach Boys, of course, but there was another group with the same company in Britain and in America, called the Beatles. Could it perhaps be that it was just too much for one company to handle two such groups effectively? And did the arrival of Pet Sounds only serve to pave the way for Sergeant Pepper a year later? Al Curry of Capitol Records. I tend to doubt that only because uh, I think when the Beatles hit shortly after I Want to Hold Your Hand and, and the other uh, uh, follow-up you know, records they had and then their albums and then their television appearances, th there was a certain magic about the Beatles that you couldn't compare to the uh, Beach Boys. I think in, in those days that the Beatles, uh, when they finally put out uh, Sgt. Pepper, their masterpiece, that it, w it all built up to that. In the case of... of of the Beach Boys, it didn't build up to Pet Sounds. Pet Sounds maybe came four or five albums too too soon for them, you know? I don't think that Pet Sounds, as far as capital personnel were concerned, helped Sgt. Pepper. I think Sgt. Pepper would have been uh, as big an album that it was with or without Pet Sounds. You know, I, don't think, I think it had no, no bearing whatsoever. Both those albums did an awful lot because even in the, in the case of Pet Sounds where uh, it wasn't the, one of their all-time bestsellers as far as the consumers was concerned, rock groups that became an immediate favorite of all the rock groups, the up-and-coming rock groups and even the more established rock groups. So I think that that album, Pet Sounds, did have a fantastic effect on the business or the, or the future of rock music, you know, even though, it, like I said before, it wasn't already an overwhelming uh, sales success, you know. But I, I must tell you that, looking back at it, uh, nobody should be ashamed of the sales because it, it did have respectable, very respectable sales. I would say that the last that we looked at those figures many years ago, it was well over half a million units. In fact, the sales for the album will now be much higher as the album's been repackaged by Brother Records in America and released through the group's present company, Warner Brothers, and sold as a two-album set with Carl and the Passions So Tough. One interesting point with this version, though, is that it's only available in mono. In fact, it says on the sleeve, this recording is pressed in monophonic sound the way Brian cut it. Carl Wilson. Yeah, it was a mono record, and the engineers at Capitol, uh, I don't know what you call it, I think they called it duophonic, and it was a thing they did with the EQ, and they amplified different frequencies on the opposite sides to make a stereo sound in that some frequencies, maybe some of the mid-range and the very top end will come out one side and then the, the low end uh, and the vocal range will come out in the, on the other side. It was to give definition to those parts and make it sound stereo. But it was really mono. But that was a very complete record, so it sounded like stereo because of the arrangements. They flowed in such a way that Musically, it was like uh, what the other people were doing in stereo sound effects. With the passing of years since its release, the group can now afford to look at the album with some degree of detachment. But justifiably, they're still very proud of it. Mike Love. Because of that hard work that we put into it and the, the musical content, I think it has proved itself in spite of the fact that it had overcome a little opposition to the record company and not really a lot of promotion. They just kind of put it out, but it kept building and building. Now it seems that it's a lot of people's favorite album. Why the title Pet Sounds? We were standing in the hallway in one of the recording studios, either Western or Columbia, and we didn't have a title. So we were thinking, uh, maybe it's a double entendre. <laughs> we had taken pictures at, at a zoo, and, and there were animals, and there was animal sounds on the record. We were thinking, well, it's our favorite music of that time, so why don't we call it Pet Sounds? I mean, it was that simple. You know? I think it's a fitting title. It's a fun title, Pet Sounds. A fun title, but an advanced album, and maybe this was really the problem. Perhaps it was too soon. 
Brian's wife, Marilyn, certainly thinks so. Yeah, I don't think people were ready for it. No, I think it was just too much of a shock. <laughs> mm. But a lot of people who understood it, you know, really uh, recognized the, the quality of it mm. immediately. How did people respond to it in California? People in the industry just, they were, go they were going, ah, at it. And uh, the public, I don't think they took on to it quite as fast. Mm. Now they know. I think the, all the, everything that Brian put into it, the people really had to grow with it. And now, you know, when they hear it, they can just hear the, the special quality of it because it really is a kind of like a um, timeless mm. album. It'll, I think it'll just be a classic of its own forever. I keep looking for a place to A song which is so right in the context of the album. Well, there's little left to say, really, so I'll leave it to music critic Richard Williams to pay his tribute to Pet Sounds, followed by just a few words from Carl Wilson. I think, in retrospect, Pet Sounds is a finer album than Sgt. Pepper, which overshadowed it, which I think is a, is a great shame, and obviously put the Beach Boys back, perhaps, two or three years, in, in the public eye, anyway. Um, and if Smile had come out, who knows what would have happened, because from what we know, Smile could well have turned out to be the greatest pop album of all time. I think Pet Sounds, for instance, is dated much less than Sgt. Pepper is dated. It sounds much more current. Anyway, for us, it was the best we could do at the time, and we thought it was good for us.